Only in America. 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 Welcome back to Only in America. This week, we are between a wall and a hard place, looking at the policies that impact the people along the U.S.-Mexico border. And we begin this series with an anthropologist studying the migrants who have died or gone missing during their journey to reach the United States. And I created this big graphic with 3,000 red dots on this wall showing migrant death. There would be this like audible gasp about this is a killing field. There's thousands of bodies that have been found and probably many more that will never be found. And I said, okay, what if we take these red dots and turn them into toe tags? This is really heavy stuff. But I wanted to remind people that, hey, we keep talking about building a wall. We keep talking about these asylum seekers. But what about the deaths that have been occurring for 20 years and that continue to occur? Can we get you to connect with this in a different kind of way? It connects them to this individual. And then they take a step back and look at this giant map of death and to go, well, this isn't random. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nurani. We begin the new year, if not the new decade, taking a journey across what has defined so much of our nation's immigration debate, the U.S.-Mexico border. If anything, the border is a series of contradictions, politically contentious and economically critical, dehumanizing but also humanizing, and more times than not, deeply misunderstood. Our first series of 2020, Between a Wall and a Hard Place, takes a closer look at different factors along the border to distill the reality of the situation. In each of our conversations, we'll balance the past with the present with the future of the border, from the perspective of artists, anthropologists, faith leaders, policy advocates, and policy makers. Along the way, we will better understand the impact of the Trump administration's simple, blunt force border enforcement policies. And quickly, we're going to realize that there is no simple solution to the challenges that we face. Because here's the thing. Most policymakers think that enforcement-only policies will deter migrants from crossing the border. But our guests in this series will tell us time and time again how that approach has failed to solve the actual problems that exist. We'll dive into the human consequences of these disorderly border policies, plus the chaos it's creating on both sides of the border as asylum seekers wait in Mexico. Ultimately, we'll talk about what the future of the U.S.-Mexico border looks like and what border policy needs to be. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. And from Humanity United, When humanity is united, we can bring a powerful force for human dignity. My guest this week is an anthropologist and an expert on the human consequences of border crossings. But instead of writing academic articles that are well limited in audience, he's taking his work to the public in incredibly powerful ways. Jason DeLeon is a MacArthur Genius Fellow and author of The Land of Open Graves. In his book, Jason explores the human consequences of deterrence policies through an in-depth anthropological study of crossings through the Sonoran Desert. Jason reveals the daily suffering and deaths of migrants attempting to cross into the United States through a combination of ethnography, archaeology, linguistics, and forensic science. As a result, Jason is able to explain how the deterrence has failed to turn away border crossers for over two decades. Instead of deterring crossings, in fact, Jason says that our nation's border policies have turned the rugged terrain of southern Arizona into a killing field. Jason's current project is a global exhibition that displays thousands of toe tags of people who have died or gone missing while traveling through the treacherous desert. The exhibit, Hostile Terrain 94, will be installed in more than 100 locations around the world starting this summer. Jason told me about the journeys of people who have unsuccessfully made dozens of attempts to cross the border and the objects and the bodies that were left behind. I will start with a big thank you very much for for joining the uh, season three of Only in America. Thank you for having me. 
and like a you know no pressure you are the first episode of season three so uh the success of season three rests on this conversation all right i will do my best to uh yeah, right. keep, my, keep my filter on <laughs> so jason how do you find yourself where you are how did you get where you are today um i studied anthropology as an undergraduate student uh here at ucla where i, I currently am um employed and then i ended up doing a, a phd in archaeology uh, at penn state university and for about 10 years as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student, I was working on issues related to ancient archaeology, so trade and exchange in um, in Mexico and Panama. Um, I worked a little bit in Southern California, but thinking about the deep past and what we can learn from the material traces that people have left behind. It was during the course of that work um, in Mexico, working on excavations with working class women and men who were getting paid to dig ditches with archaeologists that I began to talk to folks about their immigration experiences, or these were stories that we were sharing in these excavation units about people's lives. And I found myself increasingly more interested in the stories that I was being told, um, that these experiences that my friends had had, and less interested in the artifacts that were coming out of the ground. And so I did what I would not recommend anyone to do, is I spent you know six years getting a PhD in uh, ancient archaeology, and as soon as I graduated, I basically said, okay, now I'm going to jump ship and do something completely different and go on the job market and try to pretend that I'm a cultural anthropologist who is going to be studying some vague project uh, related to, to immigration. Kids don't try this at home. Absolutely not. I mean, people think that uh, that I've, you know, my, my career path has been uh, unorthodox to say the least. And people think, oh, it's just this kind of, it looks so easy, I think, from the outside, but it was a lot of failed starts and frustrations and, um, you know, moments of like, should I be doing this? Is this the right move? I've just spent 10 years doing one thing and now I'm pretending to know something about um, about immigration, which I've never really studied. So I, you know, I took a job at, at the University of Washington or maybe they felt sorry for me or they maybe they, they saw something in, in me and, and believed that I could make this shift. And I spent two years there kind of redefining myself and thinking about an anthropology of undocumented migration. And what it ended up happening was when I started shifting gears, I felt like I had wasted, you know, 10 years of my life doing archaeology because now I wanted to study this contemporary thing that, that seemed so far removed from what I'd been doing previously. But what ended up happening was I, I realized early on that border crossers, migrants, like all great migrations like that humans have done, leave things behind in their wake. And it just so happens that people who are crossing through places like the Sonora Desert of Arizona have been leaving stuff behind. And so I found a way to both work with contemporary people to learn about their experiences, but also then to employ this approach of archaeology then to understand what the material footprint was of this of this process. But that was totally unexpected. I mean, you know, I remember at one point talking to my wife and, and being like, I've wasted so much of my life now that I'm going to do this other thing. And I'm, I feel like archaeology was a big, was a dead end for me. And it ended up being, you know, quite the opposite. And you used the term uh, deep past. I've never heard that phrase before. And it struck me because it just feels like so many people are, they're kind of removed from the migration debate and kind of what happens. And I feel like that's changing. But do you find that your work, whether it's the book that you wrote or the installation, both of which we'll talk about in a second, that, you know, it's it's bringing migration and the migration experience a little a little bit closer to people? You know, I, I hope so. Um, and, you know, I want people to kind of get an up close look at this process, whether that's through photographs or hearing the stories of migrants or, you know, seeing, touching, smelling the things that people have left behind during this process. And, um, you know, I, I think with the work that we do, there's so much out there uh, around issues of migration. I mean, and as I joke, like we don't need another book about border crossings or undocumented migration. And I say that as someone who's working on a new book about, you know, undocumented migration. Right. Um, but, you know, so I, I think what we've tried to do is to say, OK, we know that people have this on their radar in some way, shape or form, and they're probably sick of it or they probably think that they've already figured it out or it's so overwhelming, all the information that's out there that they don't even know where to begin. And I think with anthropology, what, what we've tried to do is present this thing that is seemingly familiar, you know, immigration, but give it to people in a very different way. And so that they can engage with it um, in this new manner that will hopefully get them to think about it differently. Because I know that, you know, I mean, as, as someone who who follows immigration um, in the news, it's exhausting just to keep up with the news cycle. And and that's me, someone who's deeply interested in this, who's, in, you know, wants to be informed. And if I'm going, man, if I can't work through these these articles, how do I expect someone who is coming to this for the first time to um, 
to connect with these issues. And so I think for us, whether it's installations or through thinking about artifacts or through um, other forms of public engagement, it's how do we bring this issue close to home to people so that they can um, understand it kind of on a both on an intellectual as well as a personal level. Uh, but that's a real I mean, that's a real challenge with the immigration work. Mm -hmm. So at what point after you made this transition, you know, what was the first thing that you discovered the first you know, artifact or, 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 you know, the, the piece that somebody left behind where you, you realize, okay, there's a story to be told about, about what I just found. I didn't know what to expect because I, I had read a book called the devil's highway. Um, it's written by Luis Alberto Urea. And it's a story of, uh, these 14 men in Yuma, Arizona who die in 2001. The book begins with a, a laundry list of the personal effects that were in their pockets. And so I read this book and I'm like, well, he's kind of talking about archaeology. You know, maybe there's this, there's a potential to do this thing. But of course, I had never been to Southern Arizona. I didn't know if, what, how much stuff was out there. I saw a few things kind of on the news. I really didn't know what to expect. And so I started making phone calls and nobody wanted to talk to me. There was a humanitarian group in Southern Arizona called the Tucson Samaritans. I started calling them because I was like, look, you guys go out in the desert and I want to come out there. Will you take me to the desert? And I called, um, the first time I called them, uh, this woman named Catherine Ferguson, who eventually became a, a very close uh, friend of mine. And she answers the phone and is like, who is this? And I tell her who I am. She's like, well, what the hell do you want? And I sort of try to explain to me. And she says something like, we're not interested in that stuff in the desert. We're, we're interested in saving lives and basically hangs up on me. And so I keep calling back and saying like, look, I'm interested in this stuff too. I like, like, please, I'm really, I'm, I'm sincere. And, um, and she was just like, you know, fine. There's one person who, who can take you out in the desert who will, who, you know, will deal with you. And so she connected me up with another with another a good friend of mine, a guy named Bob Key, who also I think was was highly suspicious of what I wanted to do. And so he took me out into the desert and just ran me ragged. I mean, he almost killed me with this hike. And I think uh -huh. he, he wanted me to experience the, the brutality of the desert. Like if you're going to write about this and do some research out here, you need to understand this. And so the first thing he did was he took me on this like death march. And I don't mean to you know to say that lightly in the con. This is a context where many people are are dying. Um, but he really was pushing me to to to, to do this hike to get to a place where we suddenly come down into a wash and then there are just thousands of backpacks and water bottles and just stuff everywhere. I mean, it's like this really overwhelming mound of materials. And that was the kind of first moment where I said to myself, you know, there is something here. This is emotionally Im impacting me. I'm, I'm already thinking about it intellectually and archaeologically. There's something really meaningful here. And now I just got to figure out what to do with it. So I think my, my first kind of engagement was really being overwhelmed by just how much stuff was out there. And then connecting with folks who were working in with for different agencies who would say, oh, you're interested in this stuff. And they would pull something out of their backpack. You know, the first time someone gave me something was a, a federal employee who was working on on federal lands who said, oh, you know, I got your phone call and, and I thought maybe you'd be interested in this. She gave me two photographs and a child's boot that, that she had recovered. And she said to me, I don't know what to do with these things, but I know that they're important. And so I hope you can take them and, and, and find something meaningful to, to do with these things. So what did you do with those, those two photographs in the boot? You know, the boot sits on my desk at home, and so I look at it a lot and just kind of think about that sort of first moment. The photographs, they're in my first book, The Land of Open Graves. You know, we didn't really know the, the context from where they came from. We don't, you know, they weren't collected as archaeological samples, which is what we do with with our normal stuff. So they don't have a GPS coordinate or a date or any of those things. So they're kind of these free-floating artifacts. But I think about them a lot in terms of how I got started, my commitment to these materials as a, a record of American immigration history, but also, you know, the the struggles that we have had justifying the work to funding agencies, to the general public, um, you know, because now everybody, you know, you go down, you go down to southern Arizona and you throw a rock and you're going to hit an artist or a researcher who's looking at the things that migrants have left behind. And when we started, we were the only real research team working on it. There, were, there had been some artists looking at stuff, but everybody really dismissed us. You know, said, oh, you guys are the garbage collectors. You're collecting trash. These things aren't important. And, you know, those objects really remind me that that we've come a long way to justify and to really make a strong case that this is not garbage. This is not refuse. This is the, the archaeological uh, remains of, of a great and ongoing migration. And one for me that's as important as Ellis Island or the Trail of Tears, the, the transatlantic slave trade, all of these mass movements are, are connected. And, um, you know, we've just really tried to, to make a case that, hey, these things have to be taken seriously. And actually, when I think about those things, that, that boot that's on my desk and about being laughed at by folks. And now I think, you know, you can go to the American History Museum in Washington, D.C., and you can see items that we collected in Arizona on permanent display. 
it's just a reminder that if you're persistent enough, and I think, um, you know, if you believe in a cause, you can at least make a little dent in the public's perception about things that they might not understand initially. So on that, along those lines, how do you draw that connection between that backpack or that boot and the United States policy that led to somebody making that decision to leave that boot, to leave that backpack? You know, it's, it takes a lot of work. Um, you kind of have to be able to move, like, I think you have to be able to scale the analysis up and down. And so like when we use stuff on, ex on exhibitions and people will come, like we did an exhibition between 2013 and 2017 called State of Exception and was most known for this giant wall of a thousand backpacks that had been collected from the desert. And in, it, in the, the first kind of iterations of that exhibition was just the backpacks and objects. And people would come and they would really be moved by the backpacks and, you know, they would try to think about that, what it actually meant. But it, it felt like sometimes people were, were empathizing more with the backpack and not necessarily thinking about the big picture. You know, who are these individuals who left these backpacks behind? How are their, are their lives connected to these larger global and, you know, economic and political structural forces? And so we started putting little speakers in the backpacks. So now instead of just gawking at this wall of backpacks, you could look at it and then get close and hear the voices of people telling their stories about, about what had happened to them, why they had come. Um, and so, you know, I find that it's almost like, you know, there's not one medium that, that can do all these things. And there's no kind of one story that will also, you know, do these things. Because, you know, I get requests from folks for exhibition materials and they'll say things like, well, can you send us like a really sad object or, <laughs> you, know, you know, it's always like give us the most heart wrenching kind of thing. And what's the most important object in your collection? And I would say, well, you know, you, number one, I'm not interested in this collection. I'm interested in what it represents. And if all you're thinking about is the object itself, then I, I think I failed in trying to explain it. But it's a lot of work. I mean, because these, these things can be easily fetishized. It's easy to forget about these bigger pictures. And um, it requires a lot of work to um, to both tell a human story connected to this archaeological or material trace that people can also connect with, because I think we as humans connect very well with material culture, with objects, but then also to say this object or this person's experience doesn't happen in a vacuum. And it sure as hell doesn't happen in a political vacuum. And so how can we then get an up-close kind of maybe emotional view of this thing and then take a step back and go, oh, this is connected to larger policies. This is connected to things like NAFTA. That's really, really challenging. And I've tried to do it in different ways through writing, through documentary film, through exhibitions. But that's for sure an ongoing one because I tell people like, look, there's no one object. There's no one story. And um you know, anyone that gives you just one story, I think, is uh, either misleading you or, or they themselves are naive about, you know, what this reality actually looks like. So through your work, how has your perception of, or your understanding of border policy or trade policy like NAFTA changed? You know, it in the beginning, I was I was super naive about how these things work. You know, I didn't quite understand the connections. And now, you know, I think I've got a, a better understanding about how, how all these pieces kind of work including the smuggling industry, which is what which is what I've spent the last four or five years trying to understand. Um, I think if you had asked me about immigration reform and then those sorts of questions 10 years ago, I would have given you fairly simplistic answers. And now, knowing what I know, um, I think policymakers hate me. I think um, a lot of journalists who are looking for a, a, you know, a short soundbite about immigration reform also don't like talking to me, or I think anthropologists in general, because we're very good at overly complicating things. Um, <laughs> You know, now I, I'm like, there's no one quick fix. You know, people will say well, we should legalize everybody, and it's like, well, no. I mean, that's that's a band aid for this much larger kind of problem. And um, how do we fix political instability in Latin America? How do we fix um, our domestic economy? How do we think about um, a fair um, labor policies in the United States? Guest worker programs. You know, all these kinds of things that um, when you start to wrap your head around them, you realize that there's no wall that's going to fix this. There's no um, you know, legalize everybody thing that's going to fix it. None of this stuff, you know, it's, it, it's so complicated that it, um, I guess I'm just more frustrated now than I ever was before about, um, about the whole thing, especially when it, when it comes to, to thinking about policy changes. But in, on the, the flip side of that, you know, my understanding of like the, the policy of prevention through deterrence, which has been in place since the mid nineties, which uses strategically the natural environment of the U S Mexico border to deter people through physical harm, you know, my understanding of that has gotten way more in depth and nuanced. And, you know, I have very strong opinions now about that policy to the point where, you know, if someone says, what is the, you know, if I have one simple response to a, a policy question, it's our policy of prevention through deterrence kills thousands of people, kills people daily. And we need to, um, to stop this, what, what I consider to be, you know, a purposeful human rights violation that is perpetuated through this policy. After the number of 
stories that I've heard, the bodies that we've found, the work with families of the missing. Um, if there's anything that's that's black and white in this whole in this whole process, it's that prevention through deterrence is a murder machine that we have been supporting as a country for a long time. So you have a, a new installation coming up, Hostile Terrain 94. Describe to me that project and that installation and, in essence, how it's building on everything that you've done up to this point. Yeah, you know, the Hostile Terrain 94, it, it kind of came out of, I was very frustrated last year about the fact that I had this book on smugglers that I was supposed to be writing, and I, I wasn't feeling in a good place to work on it for all kinds of reasons. One of them being that this political moment that we're in, you know, the world is on fire. I was thinking to myself, I need to finish this book so I can lock myself up in a room for the next two years. The book will come out in another year, and I can just close my my ears and eyes to the world outside as everything is kind of going, um, you know, going to hell. And so I decided, okay, 2020, this is an important moment to keep immigration in the news or in the in people's imagination, especially in terms of the, the human costs of our border policies. And so I, I, was, I had been working on an exhibition in in Portland, Maine, and then another one we did in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania at Franklin and Marshall College this, this past year. And one of the elements in that exhibition was a, a wall map of migrant deaths in Arizona. And we had based it on data from the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office that, that tallies these things. And I'd created this big graphic, um, a vinyl graphic with 3,000 red dots on this wall showing migrant death. And when I would show this picture to people during talks, there would be this like audible gasp about, oh my God, this, you know, this is a killing field. There's thousands of bodies that, that have been found and probably many more that have not been, ever, will never be found. So I thought, well, what if I put this graphic onto a wall? Can that also have this, you know, the, the same kind of impact for a broader public? And so we did it and I felt that people just didn't really get the sense of the weight of it. They're looking at red dots on a wall and, you know, mm-hmm. maybe some of them get it to, it's a death, maybe some of them don't. And so I got frustrated with that and I said, okay, what if we take these red dots and turn them into toe tags? So I printed out 3,000 custom toe tags, and then I asked my students to write out the names and the details for these 3,000, you know, 200 individuals. So they start doing this, and it takes them two and a half months to fill out all these toe tags. And immediately as they're doing this, the students start saying to me, this is a really difficult task that you're asking us to do emotionally. It is hard to sit here for an hour and write out these names because, you know, you start thinking about who these people were. You start thinking about the dates. You know, this person was found on my birthday or what was I doing on this date when this body was recovered in this terrible condition? So they start filling this out and they're saying to me, this is really heavy stuff. And so then I got the idea. I said, well, what if we, instead of building a toe tag wall map, we just put up a a vinyl, a a graphic of the U.S.-Mexico border with the grid. And then we ask people to come to an exhibition and fill fill up the tags themselves. Instead of looking at this exhibition, they help us to build it. And so, you know, I got this idea probably in November of 2018. I built the website in January of 2019 and basically just said, we have an exhibition. It's very cheap to do, 1500 bucks. We'll send you the full kit on how to do it. And we ask you to mobilize your community to fill out 3,000 toe tags and to mount them on this wall. And I put that out on Facebook and Twitter and immediately we had like, you know, 60 or 70 locations that were like, we would love to do this, send us all the details. And, um, you know, now we're up to, we'll get to 150 locations by uh, the end of this month. We will be on um, at least, we're on five continents now. We're still trying to crack Asia. Um, but this exhibition is going to happen around the globe where, you know, we estimate between between forty and 60,000 people will come together just to fill out the toe tags. It doesn't even include the people who will then see the exhibition. But I wanted to, to do something that was public facing in this current moment, remind people that, hey, we keep talking about building a wall. We keep talking about these as- asylum seekers. But what about the deaths that have been occurring for 20 years and that continue to occur? Can we get you to connect with this in a different kind of way? And this kind of gets back to your, your question about how I'm trying to connect with folks. And so here it's like the visceral part is the moment someone commits to, to writing out these names and mounting a toe tag. And so it connects them to this individual. And then they take a step back and look at this giant map of, of death and to go, well, this isn't random, right? One death maybe seems random, but, but 3,200 deaths in this one region becomes anything but random. And so that's a way then to, to get them to start thinking about, well, hey, this policy that's in place is killing thousands of people. And I don't want to think about these, like just this mass of people, but maybe I can think about these individuals that I have been responsible for in this moment of writing out their names and bearing witness to their experience. As you have done this work, um, and you know, whether it's you know, planning for this installation or, or other installations, what's that moment like when somebody, when you see somebody get it? You know, what's the reactions you see in people's face kind of 
when they get it, when they realize the the depth and the awfulness of what's happening along the border. You know, everybody comes to it in a kind of different way, um, whether it's anger, sadness. We, I've seen it in, in different ways. I mean, we the first time we built the wall with tags that we'd filled out ourselves, we put this thing up and we had been writing these toe tags out for several months. And at different moments we were having, you know, we were all like, I got to take a break. I got to go for a walk. But when we put the last tag up and we all took a step back, it was incredibly heavy for all of us. And we had been exposed to this for months. Um, and then we just started thinking like, oh my God, like this is the thing that's going to impact people are going to, it's going to hit them in different kinds of ways. And we need to be prepared for that. Um, as soon as this thing went up, you know, people were immediately moved to tears or, or anger. I mean, there were folks who, who were like, I know it's there in this gallery. I don't even want to come close to it right now. I'm not prepared to do that. And so we've had to work with different organ with different groups, our, our hosting partners to figure out, you know, how do we help people to emotionally sort of deal with, um, with this thing. But you, you know, it's been really, um, fulfilling to see people engage with it. I mean, we've had students that have just become, I think, so empowered by this thing. One of the things that we do with these exhibitions is we bring it to a place, we coordinate with local groups, they fill out the toe tags, we do all kinds of programming around it. So we have a documentary film we show, I give a talk probably, but we also do things like run workshops. And so, um, you know, we, we did one recently at a community college in, in Orange County, and we had students who were recording stories of other students about their experiences either in the desert or their family's experiences migrating or just how they were reacting to this thing. And for me, that it was just a really wonderful moment to see people feel really empowered to kind of take ownership of this thing. So it wasn't like we were making this thing for them, but they came in and felt like they were like they were full partners. And that's what we really want to do at the end. I mean, it's I think, you know, obviously people are going to be saddened by this thing, but we also hope that by the end they'll be more educated and then also feel like, you know, that they're not passive kind of bystander, but they've now committed themselves to bearing witness, um, to testifying in, in place of, of the dead. And then hopefully they'll carry that with them, you know, in a, in a positive way. So let's say we're having this conversation in 10 years. Um, what is the exhibit about the border and about migration that you would like to be putting together in 10 years? You know, in, in 10 years, um, I'd like to think that, that we would be looking at this that all of our errors and our abuses and human rights violations, that we could look at them as this kind of antiquated thing or this thing that, that happened in the past. And that now, you know, of course, we're much smarter about that. Of, of course, we don't do these kinds of things anymore. Um, that would be my, you know, my, my dream is that we are just a, a kinder, gentler, you know, global community that recognizes that these border issues are all connected, that they're they're not going to go away anytime soon if we keep treating them like as we've been treating them, like putting Band-Aids on these kinds of things. You know, I hope that we get to a point where we can look back and go, I'm so glad that we don't do that anymore. Or look, look how barbaric these border systems used, used to be. And, you know, the older I get, I feel like only now, you know, am I old enough to have been able to see certain kinds of changes happen in, in society that I'm like, oh my God, like it's not perfect now, but it is it is better than it was before. I mean, I think about um, the rights of transgender people today, even though uh, we are still fighting for equality for trans people. I do feel like there's this new level of awareness and understanding that, you know, when I was younger, wasn't even a, a, something we were having a, a discussion about. And so I'm kind of hoping that, you know, I, I know that it won't be perfect in, in 10 years, but I am hoping that at least uh, people will be much more educated about it. And I hope in 10 years that we're no longer having discussions about walls, that that is not a viable conversation to have about immigration, that we need to have walls or moats or, or whatever physical impediments people are, are throwing out these days. That's a, maybe a, a more simplistic uh, aspiration. And I would argue that um, the work that you're doing um, through your research and the, the art provides people that hands-on and deeply personal opportunity to learn more about what's happening on the border so that we get closer to that, that aspiration. So thank you. So the name of the, the podcast is Only in America. So there's a question I ask of all the guests at the end. And that question is only to finish this sentence. Only in America, dot, dot, dot. Oh. Only in America can you claim to be a country founded by immigrants and powered by immigrants and at the same time be um, completely ignorant of the history and maintain a, a periodic anti-immigrant uh, sentiment. And I bring that up mostly, I mean, I think I've been thinking about that a lot lately um, because we had put in a proposal to install Hostile Terrain 94 uh, at Ellis Island. 
and we put together this proposal. It seemed like it was going to be great. They were encouraging us to apply for this thing. And then the response back after we had submitted the proposal was, you know, we're we're committed to raising awareness about America's immigration history and this exhibition doesn't align with those with those goals. Um, it, doesn't, it wouldn't make sense for our visitors. They wouldn't understand it, and it's not suitable for this like this context. Um, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. like, oh, yeah, only only in America uh, do we have that. So um, for me, that perfectly en- encapsulates our, our current um, kind of a, approach to um, to immigration. And I do think that you know we're going to make a exhibition catalog for Hostel 2094 featuring all of the. 150 hosts and, and, and you know photos and materials from, from every every place and i think that that's going to be the cover of the book <laughs> the rejection letter i mean it, going back to a term you used earlier i think for a lot of americans uh they relish the deep past of immigration but not so much kind of yesterday oh completely i mean there was a an article about eight or nine years ago in um in archaeology magazine that had well, it was one of the first pieces to really highlight this work and someone wrote a letter to the editor that just said I can't believe that Archaeology Magazine is publishing this piece about these illegal immigrants, these people who are invading this country and who are ruining this country. And they said, you know, my great grandparents came here from Italy and they worked really hard and they learned the language and they became, you know, um, upstanding American citizens. And these people who are coming now are just, you know, filthy brown savages. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, that is that's our historical amnesia. And, you know, people think Ellis Island was this wonderful place to land. You know, they forget that the Irish didn't get to be white until the 1950s, that we were so anti-Italian, uh, Eastern European, that these folks that were coming here were never welcomed with open arms. We were always, you know, we, we've mistreated every wave of immigrants. And then it's with, with enough time, you can then kind of whitewash that. And part of our work through the archaeology and these other things is to try to prevent that. Because I know in 50 years, and you're already kind of seeing it, you know, um, Mexican Americans who are like, well, you know, my grandparents came here a generation ago, and they're much, you know, they were much better people than these horrible Hondurans who are coming here kind of now. You know, you're already seeing, you know, um, some of this whitewashing happening. And part of our work is to is to keep the dialogue going and to um, constantly remind people that hey, just because you don't want to remember it um, doesn't mean it didn't happen. Well, thank you so much for the time, Jason, and thank you for your work. And I am really looking forward to seeing the installation. So thank you. Oh, Ali, thank you so much. Jason DeLeon is a MacArthur Genius Fellow and author of The Land of Open Graves. You can find more information about Jason at our website, immigrationforum.org slash podcast. And while you're there, subscribe to Only in America to stay up to date when new episodes are released. Tune in next week for our next chapter of Between a Wall and a Hard Place. We'll hear about what happens when migrants arrive at the border and the people who are helping them. We'll learn about how the faith community at the border is sheltering and providing aid to migrants and the challenges that they face in doing so. Only in America is produced and edited by Emily Chow, Joanna Taylor, and Megan Wetmore. I'm Ali Nirani. Talk to you next week.